Welcome, everybody. It is seven o'clock, and we are ready for the Michigan State University Beekeeping Q and A webinar. We're here in October, end of the season. I'm sure many of you have lots of questions, and we had many submitted, and so we're going to go through these questions today, and hopefully give you all a leg up on uh, getting bees through winter here in Michigan. Really to introduce our team and who we have with us tonight to be answering your questions. Um, we have the MSU Apiculture team that's comprised of five individuals that work across the state of Michigan. Uh, we have Dr. Megan Milbrath, who is an uh, associate professor in the Department of Entomology and also works with MSU Extension. Uh, she is uh, very well known across the country for her beekeeping education and research. And she also has a beekeeping operation of her own that she operates in Jackson County. We have Anna Heck, who is an extension educator um, who works across extension and across the organization um, to help individuals, beginning beekeepers, um, folks uh, that deal with uh, pollinator policy. Uh, and then she also works on the Heroes to Hives program as well. Um, and she has a beekeeping operation in Ingham County. We have Dan Wines, who's our Be Informed Partnership tech transfer team member that's based out of MSU. Dan works with commercial beekeepers across the United States and is also, uh, also has a beekeeping operation in Ingham County. Uh, you have myself, Dr. Adam Ingrao. I'm an extension, extension specialist. I work across the state of Michigan and across the nation, primarily working with veterans and I run the Heroes to Hives program. I also have a beekeeping operation of my own up in the Upper Peninsula in uh, Luce County. And then we have Dr. Zachary Wang, who is based on campus. Uh, he's a professor in the Department of Entomology, and he deals with a lot of honeybee biology, um, and he also keeps bees in the Ingham County area. We get a lot of questions over the course of the season, and this year we have moved towards a more kind of centralized format to answer your questions. So we're asking beekeepers across the state of Michigan as you formulate questions and want to have those answered by an MSU, uh, MSU expert, you submit those questions through eExtension in their ask.extension.org uh, page. This allows you to enter a question, your beekeeping question, and that is then answered by an expert. The nice thing about this is it allows us to really keep track of questions. We also get notifications as experts to help us understand or help us better monitor your questions. I will say this just from, you know, the hundreds, hundreds of emails that we all get, well, weekly uh, at least, um, a lot of times those emails can get buried and uh, get lost. And so this way we can really stay focused on making sure we get your questions answered. So ask.extension.org backslash ask is that, uh, that avenue to get so those questions answered. All right, and you have all been, uh, many of you have been part of the MSU Apiculture webinar series that we've had going on all year this year. Um, we, we really want to, you know, give you the best information possible and also give you access to those webinars uh, in a recorded format. And so at our pollinators.msu.edu backslash resources backslash beekeepers, and we're going to show you this web page here in just a moment, but that's where you're going to find our upcoming webinars uh, for webinars that are coming up. You'll find our webinar recordings. You'll also find links to videos, articles, all sorts of resources that we put together there. And then this is also where you will register for future webinars. And the way that you're going to locate that is you're going to go to our Michigan Pollinator Initiative page and you're going to click on the beekeepers right there with the big red arrow and then in that resources tab on the right side of the page you'll find the MSU Apiculture Extension webinars link right there that'll bring you right to them. In addition, if you want to stay up to date on everything that's going on with pollinators and pollination at MSU, um, we also have an option for you to sign up for our newsletter. That's under the, under the Stay Connected tab on our, our Michigan Pollinator Initiative site. And you click on Newsletter and then pick the Pollinators and Pollination uh, newsletter update to get those regular newsletters coming to you through Michigan State University Extension. Few more resources here. We've got our MSU Apiculture Facebook pages. We've got our at MSU Honeybees Facebook page, our at Heroes to Hives Facebook page, and our at Michigan Pollinator Initiative page. This is where you're going to stay up to date on all things going on at MSU related to honeybees and pollinators in general, and a great way to, to just stay connected to all of the things we have going on at MSU. 
In addition, we wanted to mention that we our Heroes to Highest program, which is our free nine month beekeeping program for veterans, active duty personnel, National Guard members and reservists, as well as their dependents. That program um, runs every single year. We're entering our sixth year of the program running at MSU. We've had nearly a thousand veterans that have gone through the program to date. Uh, the program is an online and on-ground program, and you can find more information about our program at heroes2hives.com. Uh, we wanted to talk about this just real quick tonight because enrollment for this program starts November 1st through February 28th of, of uh, 2021, and our classes will start in March. So we're gonna have enrollment opening up here just in a few days. So if you know a veteran or you are a veteran or if you're still serving and are interested in beekeeping, this is a great way to get a year under your belt. Um, working with us directly and getting that training uh, right to you at your home online and then having the opportunity to do on-ground training as well. And then we also have our Pollinator Champions program. Pollinator Champions is a free program that you can take to learn more about the wonderful world of pollinators and how to support them. Uh, you can also become a certified pollinator champion for a small fee and be able to share your love of, the, um, of all of the pollinators in general with everybody around you by sharing our resources. So if you're interested in doing that, uh, let us know and, um, and we will, it, well, let us know and also check out the Pollinators Champions website to uh, join that program as well. All right, hi everyone. So I just wanted to do a couple more announcements. One is that we have a crowdfunding campaign. So um, we get funding for our positions from things like uh, the university grants, endowments, but a lot of times we don't, uh, we need funding in order to do the programs that we want to do. If we don't have a grant to do a specific project, um, we are oftentimes looking for funding. And one really great way to support our work in our education and programming is to make a donation or spread the word about our crowdfunding campaigns. So we have links to this on our webinar page of our uh, website, and you can also see a link there. And this is a fund that will help us spread the word about beekeeping and increase our beekeeping capacity and resources here in Michigan. Another really fun way to support our work is the Adopt a Bee fundraiser. So a committee of the Michigan Beekeepers Association came together and they made this campaign for us. So the donations will go towards supporting our work, but it's really fun because you can find someone and give them a, um, or with your donation, the committee will send a postcard and a really fun letter to whoever you choose. So to do this, you can go to michiganbees.org and then click adopt a bee. And there is different age groups. So you can select the recipient. They have um, age appropriate letters. So some are for children or youth or young adults. Some are for adults. Um, and you can do it for a special occasion or just because. And the letters are really beautiful. They're really well done. Um, and so this recipient will receive a letter as well as a postcard. So we hope you consider adopting a drone or a worker or a queen for someone you know. Uh, we also wanted to share the American Honey Producers Association uh, has a conference, a virtual conference that will be in December. Normally these, this is an in-person conference it's an, and so it would require some travel. Uh, this year it's going to be virtual, so you hopefully will get the chance to attend. Uh, registration is $50. You can go to American Honey Producers Association for more information. And then one fun thing we decided that uh, we'd like to share some of our favorite resources for you, with you all. So today we'll share a podcast that's called Two Bees in a Podcast. It's by the University of Florida Honey Bee Research and Extension Lab. And they had excellent guests on it. It's really fun. I, I listen to a lot of podcasts that are about the news and in these COVID times, there's not a lot of really uplifting stories all the time, but the two bees at a podcast is just really easy and fun to listen to. The, it is based in Florida. So when you're thinking about beekeeping management, it is very different in Florida than it is here in Michigan, but the hosts normally do a good job of acknowledging that because they know they have a national and international audience. And they really get some big speakers and researchers and um, experts on their podcast. So if you're a podcast listener, I suggest you check out Two Bees in a Podcast.
All right, thanks, Anna, for all of that great resource uh, and uh, potentially new podcast to check out for all of our folks. So we're going to start today by talking a little bit about what we've done for our bees already and kind of where we are going. So what we've done for our bees already. So Varroa, we have been monitoring and controlling Varroa throughout the season. I know that those of you who have been in uh, sessions with us before, you know how serious we take Varroa and it is something that we talk, harp on all the time. And so that is something that is a season long effort. So that is something that you do throughout the entire season, not just something at the end of the season. So we've been working on that all year. We've also removed our honey and reduced hive size as we get ready for winter, ensuring that the hive that we have left over is packed full of honey and that there's not any dead space in there, meaning no empty frames that are areas that, could, that bees could starve out on. We've been feeding as well, making sure that any, that any chance that we get, we can get those hives to put on as much weight as possible as they are going into the winter. We've also been dealing with queen issues and combining colonies. So weak queens that maybe were taken out by a formic treatment or something like that. We've been dealing with those. And then we've also been combining those weak colonies uh, to ensure that we're not try to, trying to limp through dinky colonies through the winter, but rather are overwintering strong, robust colonies. We've also been storing equipment. So as we've been taking equipment off the colonies, condensing colonies and getting things ready for the end of the season, we've been storing our equipment properly and putting that away. And in addition, for those of us who are getting habitat going, we've also been planting habitat, um, well, near the end of the season and, and even now as we're getting later into the season, bulbs and things like that, rhizomes that we can plant late season, we've still got an opportunity to do that as well. In addition, what we are doing now for our bees, so that's what we've been doing um, previously. And now what we are doing currently is we are still working with equipment storage. So as we're, as we're taking off that last bit of equipment, we're putting that in, we're making sure that the frames that we're storing are, are proper frames to be storing. Um, we're ensuring that uh, everything is, is put away so that things like mice can't get to them. We're also continuing our Varroa control, and now we are moving to oxalic acid, which is the treatment option that we use during the broodless periods, so late season and early season treatments, and so that's something that we've got going right now. And, and in addition, we are continuing to work on those plantings. If you've got opportunities to still get things in the ground, now is a great time to get those fall plantings in. Okay, so equipment storage. What are we doing now to prep for winter? So this is my yard um, a few weeks back um, where you can see that it's just kind of chaos. There's been all sorts of equipment that has come off of the hives. After we've harvested honey, we've got all of these, these drawn frames that need to be stored. We've got all of these you know, excess pieces. You see, uh, you see uh, queen excluders there in front. You've got um, top covers, inner covers, bottom boards, all of that good stuff that needs to be stored over the season as far as excess equipment is, is concerned. And so what I generally do is I get my materials ready for winter is the big things that I'm, I'm looking for is I'm just making sure, number one is I'm going through my frames that my frames don't have any stored pollen in them. Pollen tends to be uh, 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 the protein that attracts lots of things. Um, and one of those big things is wax moths. Um, generally wax moths, we, we, although they are called wax moths, they're, they're attracted to pollen, to that protein in there. And so by leaving protein in those, some of those frames in those stacks, you run the risk of actually having uh, damage from uh, wax moths coming in looking for that protein. So as far as keeping those frames safe, I generally will call the frames that have pollen and then I will call old frames that have been in the apiary for many years and are ready to get switched out. And then I'll take the, all of the good frames, situate those in my boxes, and then cover the bottom and the top of the box with a top cover to ensure that I don't get any of those pests coming in and dealing with and, and destroying my equipment. Other equipment I, I have is just stored under covered storage. It is all outside during the winter, but it is under a covered storage area. So uh, that's some of the stuff that I've been doing with equipment storage. And uh, what are some of the other things that you all have been doing, Dan, Anna, and Megan? Sure, so I would say that one thing that I try to do is um, if I have brood boxes, try to leave them on the hive. So I'm normally planning ahead 
in the season about which boxes will be used for brood and which will be used for honey supers. But even if I have an extra deep, normally it's easy to keep a third deep at the bottom and empty deep at the bottom of a hive versus trying to figure out how to sometimes store that at home. Um, Do you want to talk about honey supers, Dan? Yeah, just as kind of Adam mentioned, things are stored um, outside under cover, also kind of bee tight and uh, mouse tight between uh, generally between a couple of telescoping lids or a, a bottom board that's blocked off and a, and a lid. So kind of weatherproof and uh, critter proof. Um, also when putting that stuff away for the year, we've uh, been sorting out things that aren't bee tight one to prevent uh, robbing during storage, but also um, a lot of times we'll pull honey with the skateboards and it's important that the supers be bee tight. So this is a good time to kind of um, Pull some of those out. Some are repairable. Um, some are destined for the burn pile if they're if they're rotted. Um, but just kind of a good time, so um, everything's kind of neat and tidy and organized. Another thing like um, queen excluders, they're not going to be used again for seven or eight months. So kind of cleaning those up, cleaning the um, you know wax and propolis off them with a heat gun and a, and a hive tool. Just again, just kind of general tidying and keeping things uh, so we'll be ready to go for next year and we're not storing things that would attract pests. And I will say for queen, ex so in my experience for honey supers that have been used above queen excluders, there's normally not protein in the supers like um, old um, brood casings or wax or pollen that would attract some pests. So normally I'm able to just store them tightly in equipment outside where there's a, a thaw and freeze period. Um, but I know other beekeepers do different things. Megan, do you wanna go next? Yeah, I would say one thing that I also do um, is I use a lot of queen excluders while I'm using this um, storage for my drawn comb. So the where I store my queen excluders is in my equipment just so they can act as an additional mouse guard. So especially if I'm um, concerned about a lid being not super tight. Uh, there's a question in the chat about using mothball crystals. Um, so, and just to uh, clarify, we can use moth crystals, we cannot use moth balls. So moth balls will have a different chemical than the pair of dichlorobenzene that's in the crystals. I use the crystals um, only once a year and that's usually at the end of the season when I take everything off and it's still warm out. By this time of year, um, you know, on the label it says you can reapply them, but at this time of year, it's usually cold enough that it's not a problem. So I'll use them once it gets cold, then I count on the freeze thaw. Um, the other thing I'm doing is I'm having lots of melting down of wax. Um, so, and I do cull pretty heavily. And these are any frames where the brood doesn't, if, the, if a colony died and there was brood in it, those brood frames get melted down. Um, anything that has pollen in it, as Adam mentioned, and any frame that's just kind of wonky or not really um, nice, those get melted down. And I'm doing a lot of burning and thankfully it's awesome bonfire weather. Um, and that's just for biosecurity and for keeping good tight equipment. Great. Another thing that we're doing for our bees right now is oftentimes the Varroa treatment, which is oxalic acid dribble. So, it, right in, um, in this time of year, especially when there isn't any more brood in the hives, and for some colonies, we might still be waiting for a couple of weeks before that's the case. Um, it's a really good time to use oxalic acid dribble. It's also really good when the bees are just kind of loosely clustered. So we have the label for how to apply oxalic acid on our webinar website, so you can go to that link. You'll have to scroll down to see the label. And then if you're interested in doing the dribble, you'll look for the solution method. Um, but this is a treatment that we typically do on all of our colonies uh, in the late season uh, when they're broodless. So another thing we're doing right now is planting. And I got really excited um, when someone put in a planting question because I think that this is something that should be on absolutely everybody's mind all the time. Um, you can still put in trees. It's a really good time of the year to prep, but every beekeeper should recognize that their honey has to come from somewhere and their feed has to come from somewhere. And if you're taking it, you should be putting it back. 
Um, so think about places you can add trees, think about places where you can um, add to the landscape. And if you can't do it on your own property, try to um, find people who are and give them a donation. It's a great time for an end of year donation, but just recognize that um, you gotta be putting stuff back in. All right, we're going to get on, get to your beekeeping questions now. So these are questions that were submitted ahead of time through our online form. So thank you to everyone who submitted questions ahead of time. All right, so I've got our first question and we have three questions that were submitted on this screen, but all of them pertain into the same thing, which is screened bottom boards and overwintering. So our first question was, is it okay to use a screen bottom board to overwinter? This next question was, there's a debate in my club, open screen bottom board overwintering versus adding a plastic mic check board. What style bottom board do you use? And then the last question was for winter, my bottom board has a removable cardboard pullout. So it's a screen bottom board. Should I keep it in or remove it? So the best way to, to really kind of answer this question is that in, in all of these situations, you have a screen bottom board or a, a solid bottom board. And the reality of it is, is that it really doesn't matter. In my personal apiary, I have screen bottom boards with inserts in, I have solid bottom boards, and I have screen bottom boards that have no insert because I've lost the insert. And I will tell you that it does not affect overwintering survival whatsoever. Remember that the colony itself, they are not, when they're thermal regulating during the winter, they are not heating the interior of the colony. They are heating the cluster. And so if there, is a, if there are open areas of the, of, the, of the hive itself, it is not going to be something that is going to cause your colony to die. Whether the bottom board is in or not, or whether it's a solid bottom board or a screen bottom board, it does not matter. Really, the, what's going to get your bees through the winter is varroa management and keeping them healthy throughout the entire season and making sure they have enough food to get through the winter. So the answer to this is, is it doesn't matter. All right, so this one was assigned to me because specifically because of the wording. Um, so oxalic apid vaporizing is amazing against mites. Is it truly harmless to bees, comb, and et cetera? And um, everyone who knows me in my background in risk assessment knows that that word harmless is, is just a huge red flag. Um, so first off, ox I'm gonna just tamper everything down. Oxalic acid is a useful tool. Um, it's not, amazing against mites in all contexts. One of the things that we've seen is people using only oxalic acid when um, it really has one place where it really excels. So where oxalic acid um, works well is when the colony is broodless and when the honey is off. It is definitely not truly harmless to bees. And um, I'm gonna look for some things that I can put in the chat to back that up. But we had the opportunity to speak with Medhat Nassar, who's a great bee researcher up from Canada. And he has done a lot of work with it over decades and um, has a lot of evidence where it, you know, it's definitely not harmless to bees. Um, so it, it does affect bees, especially when you get into um, the multiple applications and using the treatments where you're not managing the dose quite as well. Um, so it isn't something that you can just go in and use willy nilly and assume that it's totally benign. There's nothing that we're putting in that's totally benign. Um, but as we all know, mites are going to be, well, they have, they're very deadly and they're terrible. So um, we have to do something. So yes, it's a useful tool during the broodless period, but no, it is not harmless to bees. And no, it's not licensed to use um, while honey supers are on. So really putting it in that um, broodless period and using it only when you need to. Great, so next question is, I have a wood chip compost pile that has a bee colony in it. I need to move the wood chips, but want to keep the pollinators around. Is there a way to relocate the bees? And so this is, would normally be a situation where I would ask for a photo of the insect because 
oftentimes it's really common to see bumblebees that will make nests in a wood chip or a compost pile. Uh, it's also possible it could be wasps. Our honeybees are cavity nesters, so it's less likely that these would be honeybees. Um, it is possible sometimes to relocate bumblebee colonies, but that's not always easy on the colony. They don't always thrive after a relocation. Um, but this is again a case where it would really help to know what it is before we give too much advice. Another thing is our honeybee colonies survive the winter as a group, whereas bumblebees and wasps don't survive as a group. So that's um, sometimes you can just wait until there's a few cold frost and wait until the winter before you move things around if you can wait that long. All right, so what is the most important action I can take to give my hive the best chance to survive the winter? Um, this is another one with some really red flaggy language in the question. And the thing that we're looking at is like the most important action. And I'll tell you the things that we do think are important, but one of the things to keep in mind is that it's, it's hard beekeeping and it isn't something that you can just like do one thing and it's going to make the difference. And one of the resources that I really like is the Honeybee Suite, S-U-I-T-E, which I'll put in the chat. And Rusty Burlow, who writes that, has a lovely um, article on what I do differently. And what she says is that, you know, the thing that she does differently, and she has really good survival, is taking the time to do what's needed at the time it needs to be done. Um, so it's not necessarily like you can wrap or not wrap, screen bottom, not screen bottom, upper entrance, not upper entrance, those things are not going to be that important. What is going to be important is whether or not your bees were healthy and well-fed the whole summer. So if you have had them where they've had consistent nutrition and you've had them where you have consistently kept pests under control the whole year, that's the best thing you can do. And if you've, you know, put supers on at the right time so that they're not getting crowded and you've done your swarm management having a big healthy cluster in fall is the thing. A lot of times we do all of the wrapping and all of the stuff and straw bales just to make ourselves feel better and to make ourselves feel like we're doing something. And that's important too, we're humans. Um, but really focus on this long-term care. Okay, uh, next question we have is, what is the best thing to do with sugar water after the bees quit taking it? save or dispose of? And if saving or disposing, the best suggestions? So when we talked uh, previous webinar back in September, we answered a lot of questions about feeding and very commonly comes up, when do you stop? And, and oftentimes you, rather, you, you stop feeding when they stop taking it, either they're full or it's getting too late in the season, it's cold and they, they won't take syrup anymore. So we this is not something we're gonna wanna try to save. Um, you know, we're probably five months out from uh, springtime when bees would take syrup again. Um, if we try to save this, it's just gonna ferment. So we definitely do wanna dispose of it. Um, best place for it is down the drain. You don't wanna tip it out in your bee yard that may attract yellow jackets and things. I've still seen some of them milling around skunks, any sort of pest or problem. So just take it home, pour it down the drain. All right, so this one's a doozy. Um, but we kept it in because I think there's a lot of good information in here and a lot of um, insight into how beekeepers think about the, our different options. So it says at this time of year in Michigan, what are the best ways to help a weaker, not more than two frames of bees with a newer, very good queen nuke? And they said it's their only nuke left, so it can't be combined with another nuke, survive in our Michigan winter. So they can't send it south or west. And then there's a lot of examples. So it says, for example, if I move a frame of cat food from another hive with or without bees from the other hive, if the, if the other hives bees, would it matter if there's foragers as well or nurse bees on the frame since the weather's too cold for foragers to be going out? If that matters, what's the best way to just get the nurse bees on the frame of cat brood? If it doesn't matter, would it be better to bring the frame of bees with the, the queen without the brood? More than one frame, combination of brood frames, multiple frames, um, is it better to take the frames from a strong hive, um, which would be likely to have more mites since there's more brood or two or more hives, exposing more hives to the cold? Is there a way to move over just winter fat bees without summer bees that will be dying over the next few weeks since we can't tell them apart 
while they're alive? Do winter bees occupy certain areas within a hive? And I really love the way this beekeeper thinks because you can tell that they're really considering a lot of things. So for example, when we open hives and manipulate any hive right now and manipulate the brood nest in this cold weather, it's going to be damaging. Um, all of us really on the, that when we were talking about this question ahead of time, we really have stopped heavy duty manipulating a long time ago. Um, and we saw when this question was submitted just this week. And so um, for me, I'm making my decisions about which hives are gonna go through winter and how big they need to be in August. And I'm trying to have everybody done by um, goldenrod. So for me in Jackson County, goldenrod really peaks the first week of September. And I want them to all be set be, um, by that time. If I don't have my act together to get everything all ready by that time, then, you know, I'm, I'm just not counting on that colony to live. And another thing to think about is, you know, what you really have at this time and why you have it. So if you're down to two frames of bees, we want to think about why it was only down to two frames of bees. Um, you know, so if there was a disease or if there was just issues. Um, and then, you know, really it, it has a very low chance of surviving. I have overwintered colonies that were just basically a handful of bees and a queen. And I put them in styrofoam nukes in my basement and I had about 50% and I kept sugar water on them the whole time. And I had about 50% survival. And for me, that was pretty great because in that context, they were basically extra. So they were matey nukes that I didn't have time to sell. And they on, I honestly didn't think that they had a chance. So for you, you kind of, I would say, rather than trying to focus on how you should perfectly bump up this itty bitty little tiny hive is to just kind of count it as bonus. Um, so treat it like a little baby if you want to give it a try and it, you can keep feet on it and put it in a place that's super insulated and just see what happens. And if it makes it, um, then you've got a spare queen to make splits in the spring because it's not going to be able to insulate and it's not going to be able to really grow in the springtime. Um, so you don't have this huge resource that's worth doing all the things. If this was May or if this was um, June or even into July, we could start looking at doing things like moving a frame of cap brood. A frame of cap brood is a great way to bump up a small colony um, as long as we're being considerate about whether or not the receiving colony has the nurse bees to cover it. Um, if you have, if you want to bring over nurse bees, uh, a simple way to make sure that you only get nurse bees and not the foragers is to give it a light shake and before you put it in the hive. If you have too many bees from another hive in there, they can go and kill the queen. And so um, if you give it a light shake, that'll ensure that it's going to be just nurse bees. And unfortunately, we can't visually tell the difference between um, winter bees and summer bees, which would be really nice, um, but, but we can't tell it by seeing. So the short answer is you can do all sorts of this manipulation basically from May even into August. And then at some certain point, we just have to call it good. And, and then when we do our calculations of what we expect in the spring, we'll be happily surprised if the two frame nuke makes it through. All right, great. Next question is, what is the best way to store frames, both wet or dry for the winter? So we talked a little bit about how we're storing equipment. One really easy way is just outdoors or in a shed that uh, gets exposed to cold temperatures. Uh, you can stack your boxes on top of an extra lid base, a bottom board, especially if you're able to block that entrance or on top of a, some kind of board, stack them up. If you have an extra telescoping cover to put on top of your stack of equipment, that can work quite well. I oftentimes will use tape around any gaps or holes, uh, but having your equipment in an area where it's cold and going to be exposed to freezing temperatures can be a nice way to store it. All right, can a wildflower garden be established without killing all the turf and turning all the soil over? And the answer is yes and no. Um, and it really depends on what is there and what you want to put in there. So if you want to put in some 
perennials that are really hardy and really competitive and you have plugs to put in, so you're planting you know, established plants, you can put them in um, and, and just locally do things. If it is grass and you want to use seeds though, the, it, it really will work and you'll end up putting a lot of seeds onto grass and probably feeding some birds. Um, so it really does depend on what's there. And if it's mixed or if you have annual weeds or some forbs, um, a lot of times you can just add seeds to it. Most of the wildflowers, especially the natives, do need soil contact in order to germ. And um, so that means they do have to touch the soil. And a lot of, a lot of them can't outcompete grasses. So if it's heavy grasses, then you want to make sure that you do a lot of soil prep but if it's mixed or you have some open soil or you're putting in some older plants, you don't have to be as dramatic. Okay, our next question is, during Michigan winters, should we check on our hives or leave them alone until spring? And what should we check for? Um, and that we had another question that was very closely related to this, what, which was right below this. In the middle of winter, do you look in your boxes to assess the need to feed? Is there a temperature issue? So basically, when we're talking about hives during the winter, really the, the reason that you would check hives during the winter is if you aren't sure if they have enough food to make it through the entire winter, meaning that they, they, they may be a little light on honey. Now there's a few ways that you can check hives during the winter. And I actually do hive checks on my hives up here in the UP during the winter. I generally will do my first hive check usually around January or February. And I wait for a day where it's kind of one of those warm up days where it's sunny outside and may still be in the thirties or, or maybe the low forties, but it's sunny outside. There's not a lot of air movement and getting into the hives real quick and getting out is not a big deal. Now, when we do these winter checks, when we're looking, we're only assessing for one thing. We're assessing for, for food and how much food is left on the colony. So the way we assess for that is like this picture that we have here. Essentially, what I've done here is I've opened up the hive and I've just lifted. This has a um, moisture board on it. So that's what you're seeing here at the top. So I've just lifted the moisture board and I'm looking in. And what I'm looking for is I'm looking to see where the cluster is located. Now in this colony that we see this picture on the right here, you can see that the bees are right at the top of the colony. And what that means is that the bees have gone through primarily all of their honey stores at this point. And at this point, with this cluster at the top of the box, we run the risk of starvation at this point because there may not be any more food left in there and the clusters moved all the way to the top through all of those honey resources. So if you do check during winter, this is what you're gonna be looking for, is where the cluster is located. If you don't see the cluster right underneath the top cover, then it's down in the colony somewhere and, and still has honey left above it, which is what you want. But if you do have this situation, this is when you are gonna start thinking about supplemental feed. And that is a really important thing to think about during this time of the year, because in this situation, if I don't supplementally feed with sugar, I am going to run the risk of losing this colony right here because it has gone through its winter stores. So yes, you are gonna do some winter checks during the, the winter and you are not gonna be digging into the boxes. That is the big thing. You are just gonna be opening the top cover. You're not gonna be pulling out frames. You're not gonna be do any of that, doing any of that. You do not wanna disturb the cluster. You only wanna see where it's at during this, this, this particular inspection. And again, something you do kind of at the beginning of the year. All right, kind of on that same um, thought process here is, what are your thoughts about using a sugar board to feed bees during the winter? Should that be put on top of the bottom most box or top of all boxes? So my thoughts about using a sugar board to feed. Um, so we're talking, uh, we, we can talk, when we're talking about winter feed, we can use a candy board, a sugar board, or we can use, just use dry sugar in the form of the mountain camp method. I prefer the mountain camp method because I hate making candy boards. It, 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 not only do I hate it, but my wife hates it as well because I make a mess in the kitchen. So yes, you are going to be, you can use those if you want to supplement food. So if you have a colony that's a little light right now, and you can tell by lifting up the back of the colony how light that is, or you can weigh the colony. But if you're, if you're a little light on food right now, putting sugar, a sugar substitute on is a good idea. If you have plenty of food on, you're gonna check in that midwinter check. And if you are running light on, on food, if they've run through all of the honey at that point, then you can add some supplemental feed. 
As far as location for your supplemental fee, what you saw in that last picture is that there is a, a shim on the top of this box that was in that last photo. And what that is, that shim at the top of the box, it's on the very top. Thanks, Anna, for changing that slide. So you can see here, this is the top of the box. This is the topmost box of the colony, completely filled with honey. So again, we don't want any empty boxes on the colony. All of our colonies should be full of honey. So that way, once you know they've gone through here and they're at the top, they've gone through the food. But we, what you can see on the side of this is you can see that this is a shim right here at the top. The reason that shim is on there for my colonies is because when I do see this happen, what I'm gonna do in this situation is I'm going to be putting that supplemental food where that shim is at. That's the reason that there's a shim right there at the top. It also serves as my top entrance as well of my boxes, but that gives me the space to add that food when I need to. So, um, and going back to the original, to the question that we were answering this time, um, should it be put on the top of the bottommost box or the top of all the boxes? It's gonna be put on your topmost box. That food, that sugar board, that uh, mountain camp uh, sugar, that is all supplemental, meaning that that is basically what they're going to use when they run out of honey. But it needs to be on the top because that cluster is going to be moving up over the entire season, feeding on those honey reserves. And then when it reaches that top, that's when you're going to be adding that sugar. Okay, we have a question about moving colonies. Uh, it says, is it okay to move a hive within the apiary more than three feet during the winter? Um, and so, so first thing, I think this three feet is a fairly specific request. Um, where that generally comes from, there's kind of, you know, adage in, in beekeeping, if you want to move a colony, um, less than a yard, more than a mile. I've heard, you know, less than three feet, more than three miles. But the point is, move it a very little distance or move it far enough that it will kind of reset their, um, you know, they're their resetting their orientation cues. So what we're kind of asking here in this question is, scenario you want to move it across the backyard essentially, and you don't want those bees to go back to their old location on the other side of the yard. Um, in the winter, this is a great time to do this. Um, you don't want to do it on the coldest days. Um, just like Adam said, if you're going out to kind of check weight and have a little peak in January, February, you know, we get enough, you know, mid thirties, low forties dates sprinkled in that that would be more the time to do it than a, than a 15 degree day. Um, you do want to be very careful with them. They are going to be clustered reserving heat um, at that point. And so you don't want any jarring or anything that would, that would break that cluster, have bees falling to the bottom, they're not gonna be warm enough and they're not gonna be able to climb back up into that cluster. So being um, very gentle with it, strapping the hive, um, you know, it's probably a two person deal, strapping the hive together, you certainly don't wanna be breaking boxes apart, you know, breaking propolis seal or anything that's gonna, you know, expose it to more of the elements for the rest of the winter. Um, and also you know, waiting until closer to the spring, um, I say that, you know, February, March, something like that, before they're flying. But and if nothing else, that's going to be a lighter hive to move because they're going to have they're going to have consumed, um, you know, at least a, a portion of their winter honey. All right. Next question is: How long should we leave robbing screens in place going into winter? Uh, so this is a good question. We got it a while back. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, robbing screens are, they can be homemade or they can be purchased from a bee supply store, but it's a screen that has a really small entrance that you put in front of a hive entrance. And that is to help your bees, they have a small area to guard while still allowing some airflow. And it's to prevent bees from other colonies from robbing your bees of honey. And we uh, know that robbing can be a place where there is some pest and disease transmission that can occur. So, I uh, normally the, the general rule of thumb would be to leave the robbing screens on in place as long as bees are flying, as long as the temperatures are allowing bees to fly and forage because that's when robbing can occur. Um, you could also leave your robbing screen on year round. Some of them might also serve as mouse guards. Um, but if you'd like to take them off now, especially after frost, and if you aren't seeing bees flying a lot in your area and climate area, then that would be perfectly appropriate too. Okay, we have uh, other question here. Um, it says, we have four hives in our yard. Two weeks ago, all four hives were set at three boxes. 
all had brood eggs larvae and the top box had 10 frames of honey plus honey in the two lower boxes today we went to the hives and saw the one hive was not active at the entrance as the other three opening the hive there were no bees there were a few dead bees and a few dead yellow jackets in the hive all of the frames were uncapped and clean there was a bit there was a lot of chewed wax on the bottom board looking at the frames the caps were removed rough the ends of the comb was fuzzy all of the frames brood and honey were cleaned out the other three hives in the yard were active had brood eggs larvae and honey any ideas um, so just before answering i will mention this was a question that came in um, for the September webinar that we did not get to. So just when they say two weeks ago, they're probably referring to a early mid-September period rather than mid-October. Um, and so that's relevant to the answer um, when they say any ideas. This is actually a very well described. Um, we were all kind of, as we discussed this in a meeting agreement, this is a very good description of Robin and what you see kind of in the aftermath of Robin. You haven't actually witnessed the event itself but you have found the remnants of a colony that has been robbed out. Um, if we go to the next slide here, we can kind of see a, a couple of the things um, that, that were mentioned this question about um, lots of wax cappings, um, wax flake on the bottom board and you know a few dead bees, some, some yellow jackets mixed in, um, but not this, you know, we see you know, a few dozen bees, not you know, thousands upon thousands that would indicate that the colony all, all died at once suddenly. And then also what, what they described this photo on the right of the comb of kind of this comb with, with uh, rough edges on it. You see the, the right half of this, this picture of the comb where it's really jagged and it, it's been, that has been robbed out and cleaned out. The, the comb on the left side there where it's still kind of straight and the cylinders are intact. It's basically telling us that that didn't have any honey in it. When the robbing took place, um, that was empty comb. Um, the comb that contained honey looks like this. So, as you're um, you know, encountering um, you know, a dead colony, it's, it's always good to approach it as a learning experience. What can you, um, what, what can you learn to assess kind of you know, how it died and you know, for you know, prevention in the future? Um, so as far as what, what leads to robbing, um, you know, it, it's probably the colony has dwindled for some other reason, quite possibly late summer, early fall. That could be a mite issue that's been um, unchecked and the population is shrinking. The remaining bees are fairly weak. They don't um, really have the adequate bees to guard that colony. Um, so it, it's going to get overcome by both other bees and yellow jackets are very common in that fall. The yellow jackets tend to persist until a frost, um, but certainly other strong colonies are going to be looking for weak ones to pick on. Um, so you can, a little preventative, aside from just keeping healthy, strong colonies, um, robbing screens and entrance reducers, particularly in these kind of key times of year, being the, the late summer into early fall when, um, you know, temperatures are still warm and, and active. Now we're kind of into a, a colder period, um, so there's not as much pressure on, but we, we certainly will still have some warmer days to come with flying weather, but we, we've, we're kind of past that peak robbing period for the year. All right, so this one was um, put in last time and the person was just interested in concepts on Varroa management at Wintry and Nukes. And I think they're interested both, but I'll talk about in the context of Nukes because I know we'll cover a lot of Varroa. And how should the My Michael Palmer methods be adjusted? So for those of you who aren't familiar with Michael Palmer, I'll definitely put some um, of his key links in the chat. And um, those are things, so he's a beekeeper out in Vermont who does, has been doing a lot of work with overwintry nukes since about the late 90s, as far as I know. And he has a lot of videos on YouTube and he um, is an excellent speaker on his system. One thing that I would like to point out is that he uses his nukes as brood factories in the springtime, meaning that he overwinters these colonies in these double deep boxes that are split down the middle. So there's two colonies in the same volume of a normal double deep. And he'll take a lot of brood from them in the springtime. And if that is what you're looking to do, that does work really well. So I have some experience with that. I've done that for a couple of years. 
And it, um, it works really well as a place to kind of provide extra brood for me to use for my queen rearing operation and for selling eggs. If you're just looking to overwinter bees, um, you might want to look at other types of equipment too, because um, that style of equipment, it, it does involve moving the colonies back and forth. Um, be, or you have to really monitor them to limit their growth by removing the frames of brood. Um, and so that I'll put a um, article in the chat as well about where I evaluated the different types of those. For me, a lot of times I'm making nukes by breaking down bigger colonies. So I'm making a lot of my mite control will happen throughout the year. For the nukes, um, I am usually using oxalic acid as the main way to control them via the dribble method, um, because it is the easiest and kind of the safest to apply for really small colonies. All right, so then someone said that they recently found small hive beetles in their hives. Can you cover the treatment options? And before we talk about treatment options, um, to bring it back to integrated pest management, one of the things that you wanna do is really actually figure out if you need to treat. And seeing some small hive beetles does not warrant that you actually really need to treat. So in, when small hive beetles came into the United States, what we saw is colonies would have a couple adult hive beetles, and then all of a sudden they get totally taken over by hive beetles. And in the South, like if you talk to beekeepers in Florida or anywhere in the South, for them, small hive beetles are a huge problem. I first saw my um, first small hive beetle in Michigan in I think like 2009, 2010. And it was in a cutout in a tree. And I was like, oh no, they're coming and we're gonna start seeing them and then they're gonna take over. And really what we've seen in Michigan is they haven't take over yet, knock on wood. Um, what we've seen is that it's really common to find some small hive beetles in the hives. And this is especially going to be places like on the lid or um, when you move that outside frame that was really tight against the wall of the hive and the bees couldn't get back there to police it. Those would be places you would see a couple small hive beetles. If you see a couple small hive beetles, that's not really a big deal and that doesn't warrant treatment. Um, it means the bees are managing them pretty well because the small hive beetles are going to um, find the hives. If you start to see lots of small hive beetles, like on the next slide, or if you start to see um, larva, so you have multiple generations, that means either something was, usually it means something was wrong with the colony. Um, and so that colony was really weak and then the hive beetles were able to take over. So similar to wax moths that they're actually indicative of, you know, the colony collapsing from mites or, or something like that. Um, like in this case, what I would use is I would first add the um, like Swiffer towels to it and try to trap them. So you can just use the mechanical trap. Uh, there are no amazing perfect traps. We don't have any good bait for small hive beetles. The other area that they're a problem is um, in unattended boxes. So if you're taking off your boxes for honey, we used to be able to just let them sit for like a week um, without bees in them, but now you have to do them right away so that you don't have small high beetles in those boxes. But as long as you're maintaining um, strong, healthy colonies, and as long as you're only seeing a couple adults, it really shouldn't warrant that you take further action. All right, so we are in our first year, fifth year as beekeepers and now have five hives and have for the most part been successful in overwintering our hives, yay. The biggest confusion is finding a process of producing good quality queens consistently on a small scale. I have taken a grafting class through my Grisk and MSU and had some success grafting, but it's difficult on a small scale. We've had a couple of hives superseded successfully, but balancing we just are not comfortable with the process to get a new queen when it's obvious to us and not to the bees that they need a new one. It seems that there are too many techniques to choose from. Yeah, there are a lot of techniques to choose from and that's just because people like different ones. Um, so just like a lot of other things, there's no best method for um, queen rearing. 
you just have to find a system that you like. So for creating a starter, for example, you can use a swarm box, you can use a cloak board, and you can just use a queenless hive, or, or there's even variations on that. And the reason we have three different ones is because people like to do things differently. Um, I find that I use all three of them through the same year. If you don't like grafting, um, and, and grafting, I'm, I'm surprised to hear that it wasn't, it was difficult on a small scale because there is a, a lovely document that um, I'll add to the chat or someone can if they beat me. It, it's called Queen Rearing for Pennies. And the idea is you can get a grafting tool and about 10 queen cups for literally, you know, a, a few dollars. And that can allow you to do it. But if you don't like grafting, that's legitimate. Um, I learned queen rearing on the cell punch method. Or you can do ones that don't involve transferring larvae at all. And um, in Michigan, we have Mel Disciclone who ha wrote the OTS queen rearing, um, the on the spot queen rearing. Thanks, Adam, for adding that to the chat. Um, maybe you could add a link to the OTS queen rearing too. And that's a method where you can get um, young queens in each hive really using a system of splits and, and notching the comb. But um, one of the things that I was told when I started teaching queen rearing classes is to tell people to try it four times because it is a skill, um, especially the grafting. And so you can't expect to be perfect at it immediately. Like it is literally something that you have to practice. And the first three times you're probably gonna hate it. So if you have the gumption to stick through to about four times raising queens, um, that's about the level that it should take. And maybe, I mean, you know, we're all different. So it may take you 10 times, but it really, I would really count on it being something like being generous with yourself in understanding that you shouldn't be good at it immediately and, and you should have to practice at it, um, especially with the grafting methods. And the reason there's lots of methods is because if you don't like one, then you can just try another one. All right, so we have lots of questions that came in um, through the chat as well. And thank you. And for some of you, if I missed asking you to put it from the chat to the Q&A, um, if you can move it to the Q&A, that's helpful for us. And I'll just kind of go through and address them and then and see. So if you do still have questions, you can um, add them to the Q&A as well. Um, so, Here's one for Anna. Do folks in Michigan use the one inch plastic insulation to wrap around their hives in winter or not? Great, yes, I would say there's a, beekeepers in Michigan do lots of different things. I definitely hear about beekeepers who do use that plastic insulation to wrap around their hives, um, but we definitely get bees through winter successfully without that kind of insulation. The bees form a cluster and they're really good at keeping the heat in their cluster. So they're not trying to heat the whole hive. It's, uh, if you ever have the opportunity to look at some thermal imaging of hives in the winter, you'll see a big red blob that is the honeybee cluster and then everything around it is cold. So they're not trying to heat that whole hive like we are trying to heat our house in the winter. Um, so there are some beekeepers that will use even, um, tar paper or black wax cardboard winter covers. There's other beekeepers who won't wrap their hives. And definitely hives that aren't wrapped can make it through the winter and survive. Excellent. Um, Dan, do you have any preference for oxalic acid dribble versus vapor? Yeah, so a personal preference, um, I, I like the dribble better as a method. Um, I've, I've seen more consistent results with the dribble. Also, um, we did have kind of the question that addressed, um, you know, the, the safety for the bees that, that Megan, you took and talked about, you know, nothing is truly, um, you know, risk-free, but I also look at the human aspect of that and oxalic acid uh, in a sugar solution is a, I, I'm much more comfortable uh, working with that than I am, um, you know, creating this vapor that I, I need a respirator for. And, and it, it's, it's uh, you know, you're dealing with heat and chemicals. And so I generally myself, um, 
apply the dribble and have had good results with that. I agree with you. Did, um, I prefer the dribble. Adam or Anna, do you, and, and for the same reasons that you said, it's, it's just faster and safer. Um, and I, I'll, I'll put the instructions in that in the chat, but Anna and Adam, do you feel differently? I've only used the dribble, oh, with, but I'll let Adam go ahead and talk. Yeah, I've done both, Anna, thanks. Um, I, I've done both of them. And what I will say is just from a personal protection standpoint, it is, you know, the, the vaporization method is much more risky to the actual beekeeper themselves. So from my perspective, especially if you're, if you're not comfortable applying pesticides, like as a commercial applicator, as part of regular agri agriculture, which I've, I've been for a long time. So, you know, throwing on a face mask, uh, you know, a uh, respirator and, and lots of PPE is not generally a big deal for me. But for those of you that have never had to don PPE, like, like a respirator and, and don't know about how respirators fit, you know, a respirator is something that is fitted for you. Um, it's not something you should just be going and buying. So I would agree that the dribble method by far is probably the safest application method for OA. And I put um, the dribble instructions in the chat as well as the link to the EPA label that ha has those instructions. And I've been desperately searching for the references. And um, if I find them, we'll add them to the show notes. Um, but from the lecture that we got to recently sit in with Medhat Nassar, a lot of his research was really focused on doses and using the actual dose. Um, don't, don't go overboard. Um, it, making sure that you're you know, doing it exactly as the directions say it is really important. Um, how about, are people still feeding two to one sugar water to the bees now or not? Adam, do you want to do that? Sure. Yeah, people are still feeding two to one sugar water. Um, I generally feed it until they stop taking it. So uh, yeah, lots of folks are still still doing it. Um, here in the UP, things are starting to get very cold and I'll, I do still have some feeders on some of my hives. Um, I have not been actively feeding them because they've been clustered up. So um, they're, they're still feeders on, but they're, they don't have anything in them on at this point. So, um, but those of you that are in the lower peninsula, yeah, just feed it until, until they stop taking it. Those of us up in the upper peninsula, it's probably about time to take, take uh, sugar water off. They pretty much stopped taking it. Okay, so there is a question about treating the frames with Sertan or Centauri. Um, I can speak to that unless um, anyone else has an opinion on those. So um, Sertan and Centauri are both formulations, or not formulations, they're available versions of a BT, which is Bacillus thuringiensis, which is a biocide that controls lepidopterin, so moths. The nice thing about it is it's super specific um, and it is you know, naturally derived. It, I personally do not have experience using with, it just became registered. Um, so it was registered and then it lost its registration and now it's registered again in January. Um, but it is another option um, for, uh, so I just added that label in there. It's the second EPA label in the chat. And it is another option for protecting your comb against um, wax moths. There are specific instructions on how it should be used. Um, and if you do use it and have good success, I would definitely like to hear about both the, um, how it works to apply it. I do know it's like a water drench. Um, and so that that's a system for applying to comb that I haven't tried yet. So I would love to hear both the practical and how it worked out for you. Um, there is another question about, um, we are ready to change over to sugar bricks. So from switching to liquid, what's the lowest temperature that we can safely and quickly make the change over? Dan, do you want to answer that? Yeah, I... Kind of a trick question. What's that? I, I don't think of particularly in, you know, hardly defined temperatures. Um, you know, we're certainly still going to have some, you know, 50 plus degree flying weather days. I would just say, you know, you know be mindful. You don't want to do it in the rain. You don't want to do it when it's really windy and that, you know, kind of that convective loss of the heat either. 
Um, so, you know, this time of year, you're still going to have days. If you see bees milling around on the landing board, even if they're not flying, you know, that, that's kind of a good, good idea that they're, they're not really tightened up. You're not going to do any harm by popping the lid off for a minute. So, you know, you're not looking at pulling frames or disrupting any further than that. Excellent. Um, how about still on the, the feeding train, when would we want to start feeding protein supplement in the spring? Dan, you want to keep with that one? Yeah, I, you know, for me, it's probably at some point in April, if at all, you know, some people do not feed protein um, and that's a perfectly viable option and they keep um, very healthy bees. I, so I, I think you kind of want to know what what your intent is, as with anything you do with the hive, you kind of want to know why you're doing it. Um, it's not just this is a particular date on the calendar. Um, I'm looking to push my bees a little bit in the spring because I want to make some splits. So on a given that our spring weather can be volatile, um, I, I do like to give them a little bit. Um, and I'd be looking at that some point mid late April, probably uh, in, you know, in central Michigan where I'm at. Excellent. Um, how about, are, Anna, I'm going to give this one back to you again. Are there any suggestions you have for wrapping hives with tar paper or felt? Yeah. So, I mean, if you do want to wrap your hives with tar paper or felt, there's a lot of beekeepers that have, that do this. There's resources on the internet. Um, if you look up the University of Minnesota Bee Lab has a step-by-step -step instruction guide on how to wrap a hive with tar paper. I'll find that and put it in the chat. Um, but again, we don't worry right now about whether or not our hives are wrapped. What we're worried about is if we already did enough in the season to keep our bees healthy to go into winter. Uh, we know that hives can make it through regardless of whether or not there's tar paper wrapped around the hive boxes. Um, but I will put that, that link into the chat for you so that you can see one method if that's what you've decided to do. Excellent. And then also, um, so there's a beekeeper who says, I'm in Benton Harbor. Are there active beekeeping chapters close to me? Anna, do you want to tell people how they can find their local beekeeper chapter in Michigan? Oh yeah, sure, absolutely. So uh, we'll put this link in the, the chat as well. So if you go to the Michigan Beekeepers Association, they have a map of local bee clubs. And so that is a really great, great way to find a local bee club. Um, so you can reach out to them. A lot of clubs are doing online programming right now, uh, but many of them are still very active. Excellent. Um, Adam, so talking about the mountain camp feeding, should dry sugar be placed on the top of the inner cover or for the, should the sugar be placed below the inner cover directly in contact with the frames? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I guess I wasn't very clear about where you actually put it. So you're going to put it directly on top of the frame bars. Um, with the mountain camp method, the way it works is essentially you're just going to take a piece of newspaper, you're going to lay it down right on the top bars of the, of the top box of your uh, hive, and you're going to put the sugar right on, on that newspaper. So it's literally right above, right on the top bars. And the reason for that is, is as the cluster moves up and as they're feeding through those honey resources, if they run out, you want that food right on top of them. You don't want them to have to navigate through the hole in your inner cover. You want the food immediately above them as they run out through that honey. So uh, yeah, it's going to go right on top bars. Excellent. Um, Dan, is it okay to feed fermented honey to bees? Uh, no, it's generally as a rule, it's just feeding honey in general is not something you want to do. Um, that's more from a, a biosecurity spreading disease around between, you know, colonies and apiaries within your own operation, um, or certainly not from outside, outside honey. Um, but Definitely not uh, fermented honey either. That that's not something that I I don't know. My guess would be the bees would not consume it. Um, give it they don't once the once you feed sugar syrup and it starts to ferment, they will not consume it. So my guess would be they uh, they probably would not take it. But that's yeah, that's not going to be something you you would want to do. Yeah, and I have actually seen cases of intoxicated bees um, from drinking fermented sap from a diseased tree. And actually, interestingly, just this week, there was a paper published 
on the intoxicated bees. Um, so there's some good tax dollars at work. And, but it was in apidology and it was looking at the different levels of resistance between honeybee casts. But, you know, they're, they're looking at it for use of for human models and things like that. But it, bees actually can be affected by alcohol and it is damaging to them. Um, it, it is a toxin to them. So you, it, it isn't a good way to, to get rid of it for sure. Um, okay. Are Africanized honeybees able to survive a Michigan winter or murder hornets for that matter? Uh, Dan, do you want to take that one? Yeah. Um, so with the Africanized bees, it, it's a little, it's, it's challenging when we talk about any of these, um, you know, Italian bees or Carniolan bees or Buckfast bees, or, because these days they are so intermingled with each other and it's, it's not, there's not really purebred lines of something. If, if you know, so you, you, it's more a matter of degree. Um, you could have um, a colony with some Africanized genetics in them that could survive in Michigan. Um, certainly true. I am not really, uh, I, I guess having said that, when you look at, um, you know, some of the maps going back to, I believe it was the 80s when it first arrived kind of in South Texas, South Florida. And there's kind of this map out there that shows their progression through the, the southern United States. And the thought was, you know, they were advancing further and further each year um, that eventually they were going to overwhelm the whole country. And then essentially their northward migration happened. So I don't think they are going to uh, become resident here this far north. But bees get moved around. Bees with those with a portion of those genetics could probably survive in, in Michigan based on whatever um, they're other interbred with. As far as the hornets, I'm not particularly well versed in them. I know uh, they have been out in the Pacific Northwest and um, you know mainland British Columbia, um, which I know has you know they have harsh winters there. Um, but I'm I'm not uh, particularly. Um, up to speed on what their environmental tolerances are. And I did add, there's an article on the risk of us seeing murder hornets in Michigan, um, but it, it is pretty um, unlikely, though technically possible. Um, Adam, there's a question about winter bees. I feel like we don't know a lot about the winter bees. For example, are they in the hive now? Do they ever leave the hive, say on a warmer day? And when do they die? Is it once the spring arrives or as the queen begins to lay? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot there. So um, we do actually know a lot about the winter bees. Um, and so uh, we'll share some of that knowledge with you. So one of the things is, are they in the hive now? Yes, um, they are in the hive now. Um, winter bees, depending on where you're located, they start coming on usually around kind of late August, beginning of September, and then on through October, beginning of November, again, depending on location you're at. So, so um, that's generally when they're being put on. Um, do they ever leave the hive, say on a warmer day? Yes, they do, in fact. And um, one of the things about beekeeping in northern climates that I really like, I'm originally from California, is that in the winter, uh, you have a really easy way of telling if your colonies are alive or dead. And that's if you have, you know, dead bees out in front of the colony and lots of poop all over the snow in front of the colony. That's always a really good sign. And those are your winter bees going and taking their cleansing flights during the winter. So that is when they, you will see them outside. When do they die? Um, generally when spring starts arriving and summer bees start getting put on in the beginning of the season, that is generally when we'll start to see those individuals, the winter bees decline. Um, so great question. Yeah, winter bees are fascinating organisms. Almost, you know, you think about them, they're almost like, they're, you know, you kind of think about them as almost a totally different uh, cast of bees um, in our colony. So very fascinating organisms. Technically, they do fit the de definition of a cast of bees. So a lot of people misuse the drones as being a cast, but that's not a true definition of a cast. Just to, just to well actually hear your response. Um, so there are a lot of questions about the, the really minutia of winter feeding. And one thing that I do want to just stress, because I know it's something that people worry about a lot, it's not something that you absolutely have to do. Um, if you've done your job really, really well in the fall and in the summer and your bees are heavy, those dry 
you know, the mountain camp and the sugar boards and the candy bricks and all of that are really emergency feed. Um, and so it's not, so there's a lot of like what experience beekeepers do as I go through the questions. And I just wanna say that like, we'll, we'll get to as many of those as we can. But again, if, if your colony is heavy and you were able to get a lot of feed in while it was liquid or they're able to bring in a lot of honey, that's not necessarily a thing that you have to freak out about now. It's also something that hopefully you've done your job so that you don't have to think about it till January too. Um, Cause we're getting to the point where we may not be able to answer all the questions. Um, okay, so here's one, Dan. I pulled some frames of honey prior to oxalic acid treatment. A few of them have what looks like a light layer of mold covering both sides of the honey. Is it okay to add back to the hive for winter feeding? Yeah, so, so my inclination in that case would be, yes, it's it's come out of the hive, you've stored it, giving it back to them. That, that you know, no concerns there from the, the biosecurity standpoint. Um, I would be a little, curious on this mold you're describing, but sometimes um, wax, particularly when it's cold, just kind of takes on, it gets a little bit of a bloom on it and it takes on a, uh, it's, it's a little yeah. opaque. It just looks like it's got a film on it. Sometimes you can rub it off with your finger. It's just a very light um, texture on it. So it's, it's not something I would be overly concerned with. I would say, yeah, I think you could probably give those frames of honey back to the same colony without too much concern. Excellent. There is a question about requeening in mid to late spring and when to split in the spring. And that one, I'm going to um, put the link in the chat to the webinars and also actually to our YouTube channel. We have an entire um, webinar specifically devoted to that. Um, so we won't address it here, but we'll, we'll send that um, to you or just check out the Michigan State University Beekeeping YouTube channel. Um, Okay, Anna, here's a question for you. At what temperature should you use the oxalic acid dribble method? I'm concerned about the effects of adding moisture to the cluster in colder temperatures. Sure, yeah, I can understand why um, people, it feels a little bit weird sometimes to put sugar syrup on the bees, um, with sugar syrup mixed with oxalic acid on the bees in the winter. I generally try to do it when the temperatures are above freezing. Um, so like 40s, but I do like to see the bees kind of loosely clustered and really it's not that much solution. So the maximum you can apply per hive is just 50 milliliters and you're spreading it out among the bees. And so this is something that even though it can feel a little bit of weird to put moisture on the bees, um, it is a, a, an effective treatment and it's not something that I worry about now that I've done this dozens or hundreds of times. Excellent. Um, so Adam, someone wrote in, they have three hives and they seem to have a lot more bees dying in one of the hives. We can't figure it out. Do you want to maybe direct this beekeeper with some options? Yeah. So if you have a colony that's quickly declining this time of the year, I, my first, my first thing would be, would be to ask what has, what are your mite counts or what have you been your mite counts this season and what treatment options have you done? Because this could be an, an indication that you have a, a hive that's declining rapidly from high mite load. Um, so that might be one thing to check out. Um, the other thing to think about as well is if you have a colony that's declining this time of the year, you know, if you have some bee death, you're going to have some death at the end of the season. As, as summer bees are dying, as drones are being kicked out of the colony, there are going to be dead bees around the colony. So it also depends on the number of bees that you're looking at. If it's a handful of bees, that's not a big deal. If it's a pile of bees, that, that might be a little more concerning. But mites would be one thing to, to really keep in mind um, this time of the season. And again, that's something that's more of a season long effort, um, not something that you're going to jump on right, right immediately, but that, I, that would be kind of one of the main things I would think with that kind of symptomology going along with it. Excellent. Um, and then Adam, if you want to keep going, there's two more questions on the mountain camp. One of them says, how much sugar do you pour on the newspaper? And the other one says, mm -hmm. when mountain camp feeding, is there any concern about the toxics in the ink of the newspaper? Should unused letter paper or wax paper be used? 
Yeah, some great questions. So uh, for the amount of sugar that I pour, um, well, it, right now, um, because sugar is getting harder and harder to find in, in 10 pound and larger bags, um, I'll probably just be putting a four pound bag on, on a colony that needs it. Um, generally, four pounds of sugar will fit within a two by one a spacer that's two inches tall. So four pounds would be plenty. Um, again, you know, it's, you're, you're going out there and this is supplemental feed. So this is when the colony has run out of all of honey, that's when you're gonna be adding this. So a four pound bag, at least from my experience, four to five pounds will get you through a good amount of time um, on a colony when you've added that. As far as newspaper is concerned, you do not want to use the shiny newspaper, the stuff that a lot of ads are on. You want to just use regular un, you know, unwaxed paper. I think most newspaper now has soy ink, so it's not toxic, um, but you don't want to be using any of the stuff that has a gloss to it as far as materials that you'll be using on the, on the hive. Um, so just regular old newspaper. Great, and Anna, so here's a question about using, so someone is interested in hearing about the use of essential oils in feed, um, basically homemade honeybee healthy. Yeah, so, so that's, I guess, you know what, Megan, I'm going to let you take that one. Okay. I didn't know if you had opinions on it. Um, I don't cause I have, I haven't done that. That's a good Yeah. So I don't, I, the, the thing about honeybee healthy is, um, it is a very big attractant to bees. And, um, and there isn't a lot of support for a lot of the other claims that they make. And we want to be really, 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 really careful when we're putting oils into the hive because they do have a strong smell. Most of them have not been evaluated. So the strong smell can affect the bee behavior. Most of them have not been evaluated for safety for honeybees. So, you know, just because it's natural does not mean that it's safe to honeybees' delicate little digestions. And then um, also we don't want stuff that's gonna build up in the wax and the, wax, the oils will build up in wax. Um, there are some contexts in which it's useful. So for example, if I need the bees to take down a lot of honey, it can attract it. There are some contexts when it can kind of backfire though um, of having attractive smelling oils in the colonies. One of them is you can really promote Robbie. So in most parts of Michigan, we're kind of easing out of the season of yellow jackets right now, um, but it attracts the whole neighborhood. And so you have to be careful. The other thing is it can attract the bees up. So if you're putting your emergency feed on too early, um, so like I said, a lot of times we aren't thinking about emergency feeding really until you know February. If you're putting it on now, the bees could cluster up on that emergency feed and they won't move down and move through the colony normally. Um, there isn't a lot of evidence saying that it's it's necessary for the bees or that there's a lot of value to adding it to emergency feed in the winter time. Um, so in, I, I would say like outside of the context where you really need the bees to take in a lot of food, like if you're treating a sick hive or you've got a colony that really is light, I, I would probably stay away from um, mixing up your own oils to put in the hive. Um, how about on a quilt boxes? So this beekeeper is planning on using a quilt box. Do I still put the inner cover on that and then the telescoping outer cover? Yeah, you can, um, you can still, so Norm, you can put the inner, you can even put the quilt box above the inner cover and below. The, actually, you know what? I'm going to pass this question back again because I use a different system before it. <laughs> well, I use quilt boxes and it doesn't really matter. Um, the biggest benefit is having the insulation on there, um, but you can put the inner cover on top of it, mainly because you have to put the inner cover somewhere. You know, you have to store it somewhere, so you might as well put it on top of um, the quilt box. That's a perfectly fine place to do it. But again, like, this is not going to be the thing that saves the life of your bees, um, whether or not the quilt box or the inner cover is on top of the quilt box or in your garage. Um, so there's a couple questions on the chat. So I think we're going to shoot for a, a 7.30 stop time. And so we'll get as many. There's a couple that are really um, basic beekeeping questions and about um, really general stuff. We'll try to get to the, the winter ones um, as much as possible first. But I, I personally want to answer two that I'm very excited about um, that came in anonymously and maybe is a plant. 
um, from somebody, but it says, how can you find a local reputable places to purchase beads? And then also a joint question, after all your help, assuming my colony survived this winter, are there groups besides my local club that might be interested in splits? I'm not looking to increase my apiary and I don't want them swarming into nearby homes and I'm not really into selling nukes. And the reason that I'm joking that this is a plant is I literally spent about six hours this morning outlining a plan where beekeeping clubs can um, act as a way to help you um, distribute nukes. So this is something that we've been talking about doing in Michigan. Um, I have an article on it in Bee Culture that I'll put in the chat. I think if you're interested, so first off, I would say stay tuned. Um, it is something that we are planning on rolling out this year in a couple bee clubs. If you're interested in um, participating in something like a local nuke exchange or facilitating it in your bee club, you can reach out to um, one of us and we can put you on the planning committee for that. Otherwise, um, if you're not really into selling nukes, you absolutely can find a beekeeper who is, um, especially young people who can use the income. I have had um, the situation where someone just offered for me to come over when I was just getting started and taking the nukes, you could use it to help somebody get into it or just contact the person who is um, teaching a class or working with beginners or working with, um, you could even contact us if you want to, to donate them to somebody who would, would use them. There are, is a huge demand for local nukes right now. And it's, it's pretty easy um, to, to find somebody, even if you don't want to deal with like, I mean, you could sell them instantly on Facebook. You can sell them instantly through your club, but there's a lot of people that are looking for bees um, this time of year as well. All right, so those are kind of all the questions that are related to um, the winter beekeeping that we have. So there's, a, again, there's a lot of general ones. We'll try to get these in future webinars. Um, what we'll do is we'll post this webinar to our webinar page um, once it gets lightly edited and to our YouTube channel. So make sure you check out the rest of them that are there. If you have further questions um, and we didn't get to it tonight, um, note the askextension.org slash ask. If you indicate that you're in Michigan, it will go to one of us. Um, so we'll be able to, to answer those um, as, as soon as we can. And we really do absolutely appreciate everybody taking their time out of their evening to learn about their bees. Um, it's the happiest thing for us when people take the time to become better beekeepers. It's the best thing that you can do um, for your bees. So thank you for your attention. Um, have a wonderful night and stay safe and warm out there. Thanks everyone. Have a good night. Thanks everybody.